and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. Bit of a tired dog at the moment because we've just come back from a big walk. Now, social media has been a buzz over the last week or so with Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s interview on Joe Rogan. The whole interview is over three hours, gish galloping, a previously debunked nonsense. So obviously we won't be covering everything because that would take about nine hours. But one thing that struck me when I was listening was that he often says something that has a grain of truth or a grain of half truth and then wraps it up with nonsense, which makes the nonsense sound more credible. So in this video, I am just going to look at that. You know, one of the things that we need to do too is to get rid of pharmaceutical advertising on television. There's only two countries in the world that allow it. One is New Zealand, the other is our country. Everybody who is knowledgeable is against it. Um, it and it not only has compromised, you know, has compromised public health. We now, we take largely because of that advertising, we take three or four times the amount of drugs as Europeans take. And drugs are the number three killer in our country. Pharmaceutical drugs, the number three killer after cancer and heart attacks. They're not making us healthier. We have, we spend more on healthcare, 4.3 trillion than any country in the world. And we have the worst health impacts. And we're behind like Mongolia, Costa Rica, Cuba, in terms of our health outcomes. Oh, all of these drugs, the pharmaceutical industry is not making us safe, safe, safer. It's not making us healthier. So here RFK Jr. says most knowledgeable people are against pharmaceutical advertising on TV. I suspect that is true. I am definitely against prescription products being advertised on TV. In fact, I'm against them being directly advertised to patients full stop, not just on TV. I find it rather strange that RFK Jr. is singling out TV and not looking at other media outlets like Spotify, for instance, where the Joe Rogan podcast can be exclusively seen. But what about the claims he made after that? Are pharmaceuticals really the third leading cause of death? Of course not. The third leading cause of death in the US in 2021 was actually COVID-19, and that was behind heart disease and cancer. Assuming when RFK Jr. said heart attacks, he meant heart disease, he provided some correct information when he mentioned the first two leading causes of death, but then he combined it with some absolute bollocks. Deaths from pharmaceuticals aren't even in the top 10 causes of death. Likewise, when he points to the US having particularly poor health outcomes compared with other countries, this is true. And it's confirmed in this report here. But the report provides a much more likely explanation for the disparity than over medication. 50% of lower income and 27% of higher income people in the US skip needed doctor visits, tests, treatments, follow up, or prescription medicines because of cost in the past year, which is substantially higher than any other country. So, whilst there may be some people in the US taking medications that they don't need, there are also a lot of people who can't get medications that they do need, and that is going to lead to poor healthcare outcomes. Well, I asked him this question. I said, why is it at CDC and, and every state um, regulator recommends that, um, that pregnant women do not eat tuna fish to avoid the mercury, but that CDC is recommending mercury-containing flu shots with huge bolus doses of mercury, I mean, massive doses, to pregnant women in every trimester of pregnancy. And he said, well, Bobby, there are, there's two kinds of mercury. There's a good mercury and there's a bad mercury. 
that his argument was not with me, but it was with the periodic tables, because there's no such thing as a good mercury. Again, we have half-truths combined with nonsense, or bollocks, as we like to say on this channel. Now, I couldn't find any CDC guidelines on tuna consumption during pregnancy, but I did find some FDA guidelines. Depending on the type of tuna, you can consume some while you're pregnant, but you should limit it to avoid too much mercury exposure. So we have a half-truth here. And when he says there is only one type of mercury in the periodic table, this is also true. But it is irrelevant because the periodic table is a table of elements. And we're not talking about elemental mercury. We are talking about mercury present in a compound. And the way elements behave in compounds is completely unlike their behavior as elements. And a common example used is sodium and chlorine. Sodium is a highly reactive metal and chlorine is a deadly gas. But together, they make sodium chloride, which is more commonly known as table salt. The compound bears no resemblance to the elements that it is made up of. And it's the same with mercury. The compound that contains mercury that is used as a preservative in multi-dose flu vaccines is thimerosal, which breaks down to ethyl mercury, which you can see here. The compound that contains mercury that is present in seafood is methyl mercury, which you can see below. They are different compounds and they have different toxicity. To show you what I mean, let's replace the mercury with an hydroxy group. We now have ethanol and methanol. Ethanol is more commonly known as alcohol, and many people drink it in beer, wine, and spirits. It is toxic in high doses, but generally fine in lower doses. On the other hand, methanol is toxic in low doses and is, in fact, added to methylated spirits to discourage people from drinking it. More importantly, though, we know that being vaccinated with an influenza vaccine during pregnancy is safe because it has been widely studied. And no study to date has demonstrated an increased risk of either maternal complications or adverse fetal outcomes associated with inactivated influenza vaccine. Moreover, no scientific evidence exists that thimerosal containing vaccines are a cause of adverse events amongst children born to women who received the influenza vaccine during pregnancy. And of course, you can just get a single dose flu vaccine and avoid the thimerosal altogether if you choose. In, in like 1979, they, uh, they brought on a, a vaccine called the diphtheria tetanus and pertussis vaccine. And that vaccine was very dangerous, and it was killing one out of killing or giving severe brain damage to one in three hundred kids. And it was pulled in the United States. It was pulled in Europe, and it, but Bill Gates still gives it to one hundred and sixty-one million African children every year. The same vaccine. The same vaccine, and to South Asian kid, kids. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, we now know what that does. As it turns out, they had thirty years of data where. Half the kids were vaccinated and half the kids were not between two months and five months of age. So it was a perfect natural experiment. And they went in there and they looked at it. They looked at 30 years of data and they found the girls who got that vaccine, the DTP vaccine, had, um, had uh, 10 times, or were 10 times more likely to die over the next three months than girls, than children who did not. And the they weren't dying of diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. They were protected against those by the vaccine. They were dying of anemia and bilharzia and malaria and pulmonary disease, but mainly they were dying of pneumonia. And what the researchers said is that the vaccine is almost certainly killing more children than diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis prior to the vaccine 
because it was protecting them against the target illnesses, but it had ruined their immune systems. So they could not defend themselves against these other minor infections. And well, the DTP vaccine was actually introduced in 1948 and not 1979, so about 30 years, but technicalities. Here's my vaccine card from when I was a kid. I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see it, but I got my first dose in May 1965. So what about the claim that it was pulled in the US and Europe? This is a half-truth. The DTP vaccine was replaced by the DTaP or the Tdap vaccine, which instead of using the whole inactivated pertussis bacteria, uses selected bits of the bacteria. This reduces side effects like injection site pain and fever, but it makes it more expensive. So the version with the whole inactivated bacteria is still used in some low-income countries because that allows more people to be vaccinated for the same cost. Now, of course, it would be nice if they were just given more aid, but that's beyond the scope of this channel. But what about RFK Jr.'s claim that the DTP vaccine is killing children? Is that true? Of course not. It's more nonsense. But again, there is a half-truth that gives it credibility. There have, in fact, been a number of poorly designed small studies from a group of researchers suggesting that this is occurring in some villages in a country called Guinea-Bissau, which I've probably pronounced wrong. But following the publishing of these studies, a number of larger, better designed studies were undertaken in Bangladesh, Burkina Faso, which I've probably also pronounced wrong, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. All the studies showed reduced mortality rates in the children vaccinated with all of the vaccines. In particular, the studies showed no negative effect of the DTP vaccination, and no difference was found between males and females. And if you look at the kids in Africa who die from measles or these other infectious diseases, they're all malnourished. In fact, the only people really dying from measles in the 60s before they introduced the vaccines, I think the, the death rate had gone down to like a, from, you know, tens of thousands per year to like a couple of hundred a year. This was by 63 and they were all kids most of them were kids in the Mississippi Delta, black kids, severely malnourished, and they were dying of measles. And, you know, this was before the war on poverty, before my father visited the Delta. And, um, you know, it's hard for a disease to kill a healthy person. Again, we have half-truths here. Being malnourished definitely means you will fare worse if you catch an infectious disease. But being well-nourished doesn't make you invincible. And he is also right that measles mortality had decreased for various reasons prior to the introduction of the vaccine. But were they actually down to a couple of hundred per year? No. In the decade before 1963, when the vaccine became available, each year among reported cases, an estimated 400 to 500 people died, and they were mainly children. And it's important to remember that death isn't the only negative outcome for measles. Prior to the vaccine, each year, 48,000 people were hospitalised and 1,000 suffered encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain from measles. And this is, of course, based on a much lower population than we have today. But what about the claim that most of the people that died were black kids from the Mississippi Delta living in poverty? Well, this study here looked at the demographics of who died from measles before and after vaccination. So in 1962 to 1963, the average annual mortality was 274 in white people 
and 111.9 in black slash other people. So most people dying weren't black kids from the Mississippi Delta living in poverty, although it is clear that the mortality rate was higher in non-white people and people living in poverty, which is, of course, the half-truth that makes his lie credible. And you can see that after the introduction of the vaccine, the mortality rates were drastically reduced in 1967 to 1969 across all races and all poverty levels. It wasn't a reduction in poverty that reduced measles mortality. What are you saying that the Spanish flu was? And like, what is the, the documentation? Well, the, uh, you know, I... You said that Fauci has publicly Fauci, admitted that it's uh, not a flu? Fauci wrote an article in 2008, and uh, that, I'm pretty sure it's 2008, in which he not acknowledged that it was not the flu that was killing those people. It was a bacteriological infection. And a bacteriological infection, these days, you could 100% cure all of it with an antibiotic. But so, oh. but something was making them ill and to make them vulnerable to and the that, bacteriological that's infection? That's unclear. And, you know, I read an article recently, and, and you can look up these articles pretty easily. But there, the, the article that I read made a very strong case that the illness came from testing a new vaccine in Kansas at a military base in Kansas. And I, again, I'm a little hazy on the details. But this is important to cover, right? So right. let's see if we can find this. Yep, you heard that right. He literally just claimed that the Spanish flu pandemic was actually caused by a vaccine. He read it in an article, and it was very convincing to him at the time. Now, we will get to this claim and why it is, of course, total bollocks. But again, we have a half-truth, which lends cred credibility to the bollocks. There is, in fact, a paper co-authored by Anthony Fauci that does suggest that bacterial pneumonia was a predominant cause of death from people who contracted influenza during the Spanish flu pandemic. And Joe Rogan actually pulls this paper up in the interview to sort of give everything more credibility. But if you actually look at the article, it also makes it very clear that it was the damage to the lungs from the influenza that allowed the bacterial infections to take hold. But what about his claim that a bacterial infection is now no big deal because you can just treat it with antibiotics? You know, one of those drugs made by evil big pharma. Well, you can certainly effectively treat some bacterial infections with antibiotics, but the proportion of bacterial strains that are susceptible to common antibiotics is rapidly decreasing thanks to antibiotic resistance. And the more we use antibiotics, the more this will happen. But we can limit the acceleration of antibiotic resistance by not having a cavalier attitude to antibiotic use and only using them when necessary. And we can also limit their use by preventing infections in the first place, for instance, by vaccinating against infectious diseases. And speaking of vaccines, what about that story that the Spanish flu was actually caused by a vaccine that RFK Jr. found so convincing? What's that all about? Well, I tracked down the story and the gist of it is that the Spanish flu actually started in Kansas and they were also doing vaccine testing of a meningitis vaccine at a military base in Kansas at about the same time. So that must have been the cause of the influenza pandemic. That's it. Now, just in case you find this convincing, I would just like to point out a few holes in the story. The first hole. The place in Kansas where the Spanish flu pandemic is believed to have originated is Haskell County, Kansas. The military base where the meningitis vaccine was tested is Fort Riley, Kansas. On today's roads, it takes about 
four and a half hours to drive between them. And of course, in 1918, it would have taken much longer. They are not the same place. The second hole. We know beyond any doubt that the Spanish flu pandemic was caused by a virus. We even know what the virus was. It was the AH1N1 influenza virus. Meningitis is caused by a bacteria. So even if someone had stuffed up and hadn't probably inactivated the bacteria before it was given as a vaccine, there is no way it could have turned into a virus. And of course, it would have caused meningitis, not influenza or bacterial pneumonia. And that's the problem with not doing, you know, real placebo-controlled trials. None of the vaccines are ever subjected to true placebo-controlled trials. It's the only medical product that is exempt from that prior to licensure. Another long-debunked anti-vax talking point. Of course, vaccines are subject to to placebo-controlled trials. Most recently, we ran placebo-controlled trials for COVID vaccines. And this is nothing new. If we go all the way back to the polio vaccine, that was also tested in a placebo-controlled trial. And, of course, there were a huge number of vaccines in between. But, of course, there is a half-truth that RFK Jr. and his fellow anti-vaxxers can point to to make their bollocks seem credible. If there is already an approved vaccine in use, it would be unethical to give people placebo because you are essentially risking lives. In these situations, the new vaccine is tested against an old vaccine that has been previously tested against a placebo. And one example is the MMR vaccine, which in this study was tested against the measles vaccine. And this is not just done for vaccines. It is done for all medications. You don't risk people's lives by giving them a placebo if you already have effective treatments available for a disease. Now, I could go on, but I'm sure you get the idea. RFK Jr. combines things that have some truth and wraps them up with absolute nonsense. But using this approach makes his bollocks sound believable because he can provide evidence of the things that are true. And that brings me to the last point I wanted to make. But the fact that no one will debate you speaks volumes, especially now. They can't say now that you're not popular. Yep, the old debate me bro argument. Anti-vaxxers love this one. It's easy to win a debate if you are a good talker and are willing to lie. But that doesn't mean you are right. You can't prove someone is wrong on the spot because you don't know what crap they are going to come up with. And it's twice the problem if they add a few nuggets of truth in with the nonsense. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And, of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little sleepy pie here, a treat. We really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.